good morning so let me quickly start by introducing you to some of the people that might not know who you are on the show today we have grace oladikupo she is an intern for the un but also a social entrepreneur and a human rights lawyer by profession so i'm going to allow her to do a more in-depth introduction because she's much more than what i said but i'm just um i'm just um being mild with all her compliments so grace nice to have you on the show today you're welcome oh thank you so much for having me this is an honor um hi everyone that's listening lovely to meet you all and um, yeah just a quick introduction into i think you've you've said it all really <laughs> i think you said it all um I'm currently interning in the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, and that kind of suggests that I'm interested in human rights. And so um, I I did my undergrad in law, did my master's in international human rights law. And in that time, I found that a lot of people don't know about their human rights. Like people only think that only human rights experts should know about human rights. And so my life's mission is to change that and to make sure that everybody gets human rights education and knows what the human rights are knows how to protect them is aware of the nuances around human rights and recognizes that stuff like food is a human right stuff like water is a human right and um, so uh fun fact should i do a fun fact <laughs> yeah, yeah, go ahead. fun fact um okay so i have lived in five countries in six years so i love wow. love love traveling and um, and yeah if you ever bump into me i'm always down for like a quick coffee so let me know let me know i would love to meet every single person right so so you can't just tell us about living in six countries and not tell us wh what countries you lived in so <laughs> where have you lived in where and where are you currently talking to us from so i have lived in england i grew up in ireland i am nigerian sometimes people say i look south african but i would like to stamp it that i am very nigerian um i yeah so ireland england america france switzerland the netherlands i was only there for a few weeks but i work in switzerland by living france which is very interesting actually i find <laughs> so that's remote working you're, you're working remotely from france no 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 so i well so Geneva is on the border of Switzerland. So yeah. it allows me to like come into Switzerland every day. It's only like 45 minutes. So it's not okay. too bad. Okay. Okay. All right. That's fantastic. So, but from your profile, you, you've done so much, you know, so maybe we should backtrack a bit and start mm -hmm. from when you moved to Ireland. Um, what made you interested in human rights i mean how describe how your growing up was you know mm -hmm. what influences made you chart the path that you're currently at yeah absolutely um so my family moved to ireland when i was eight years old i am an ibadan babe and yes you can carry me away with amala and Abula. just putting that out there <laughs> but on, on a real though we moved when i was eight years old and you know I I liked our life in Nigeria, to be honest, but um, I knew that my parents wanted us to have access to better opportunities. And so we moved. And just before we moved, we actually, you know, some armed robbers had come into our estates and they had robbed people. And I think that was kind of like the sign for my parents to just be like, we need to get these children out of here <laughs> sort of thing. Um, and so when we moved to Ireland, it was kind of like trying to adjust into a whole new environments like you know in Ireland they they do the educational system by age so for some my brother had like you know had to like go with the age system I had to go all the way back like wow. it was it was interesting to maneuver all of that but I'm so glad that I grew up in Ireland because I think it's um it's such a beautiful country I get to say that I'm Nigerian Irish because I, I'm proud of both of the places I come from and um, and also growing up, you know, we, I mean, we, we were really blessed. Like, I wouldn't say we had everything we needed, but I saw resilience. I learned resilience from my parents. I learned like tenacity from my parents, just being able to come into a country and do whatever it took to make sure that their children had a good life. 
you know and so a lot of the times i always say like every success i have like it's to god and to my parents because i wouldn't be here if they didn't have that level of tenacity and hard work hard work ethic to make sure that me and my siblings were okay and um, and so growing up i kind of switched between careers a lot i'm not going to lie um, I'm one of those people, like I wanted to be a journalist when we were in Nigeria and then the politician I wanted to expose died. So that dream kind of died with it. I was like, oh, there's no point. I think I was like six years old. So I don't know what I was looking for. Um, and, then, <laughs> and then I wanted to be an actress and because my dad used to be an actor at some point and I, you know, I, I love the arts. And I remember speaking to my mom, my mom was like, Tolu. I actually want to be an actress. You know, she didn't, she didn't, you know, she didn't like the life of it. And I was like, oh, okay, maybe I won't do it. And then eventually I decided I wanted to be a doctor because I really wanted to help people. Um, but then when I was doing my um secondary school exams, I didn't get enough points to study medicine. And so um it was kind of interesting because in Ireland you can put 10 courses down and they can be all different. So I had medicine, I had biomedical science, I had law, I had uh, physiotherapy, I had engineering. I was just putting everything because I was like, I'll be fine. And then I got offered law um, and I wasn't too happy about it. I think it broke my heart in many ways because I really had a plan to be a doctor. I was like, God, we have a six year plan. We're going to do this, you know? Um, and I was like, God, like, you know, we prayed, we fasted. Why did I not get this? And um, I remember, you know, when I got, when I got offered law, my dad came home that day and he was like, you would make a great lawyer. And it wasn't like, I was like, oh my gosh, yes, I'm totally ginger to do it now. But I think because my dad kind of said that, I was like, I'll give it a shot. And so here I am seven years later <laughs> in the same degree. Um, and I am so grateful that I came down this path. You know, you've said so many things that I want to highlight. You know, you said you, you, you tried or you, yeah, you tried many things. You know, you, you, you wanted to do many things, but you were not sure of the particular mm -hmm. um, one that you would eventually um, um, focus on, you know, and, and it's, it's, it's nice because I think that it's in the trying of different things that we eventually find our path, what we really are meant to do. You know, if we're not, if we don't try all these things, we won't know the ones that are actually wrong for us. You know, I used to tell people when I was in um, university that I wish Nigeria's education system allowed us to have a gap year, for instance, where we could try different things. You know, in secondary school, when I was in secondary school, you could either, you could only be into the arts or the sciences you know and and if you were in the sciences you had to be in the sciences till the end you know mm -hmm. so there was no opportunity to to even tell if you actually would be good in science you know so so you ended up then because you know university is a function of the courses you majored in, in secondary school yeah. so you so there was there's very little wriggle room to change um your course or to change the path of your life except you are willing to forfeit a year, you know, because most people that end up changing their path have to forfeit some time, especially if they didn't major in those courses in secondary school, you know, so you need to be very, very brave to actually divert your course at that age. So I said that to say that you're lucky because you, the system in Ireland allowed you to explore different things. Yeah. To be able to just, even though it wasn't your, your choice, but then again, it, it, it's, that's a great thing about God. He orchestrates the path of his own. So even when we are, when we think we're doing our own thing, making our own plans, he's, he's actually orchestrating the way we're moving without us even knowing it, you know, so I'll pause to allow you to, <laughs> to continue your state. Yeah, no, I think just, just to touch on that, I think, um, if, you know, I have a lot of friends who have gone through the Nigerian system and even my dad was a teacher. So I, 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 I've, I've seen how like, you know, the arts and the sciences. And for me, I went from, like, I studied by bi um, biology, physics and chemistry in secondary school and went into arts. And I'm grateful to be able to do that transition because today I'm like, hmm, would I have really been a good doctor? That's the question. <laughs> um, and so it's, 
I, I think it's a it's it's a blessing for me to be able to do that. But I think that would definitely be, you know, something that we can change in the curriculum in the future. In Jesus' name, <laughs> amen. 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 Okay, so I'll I'll ask you this. So you studied law, um, <laughs> by by um, should I say default now? You know, but 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 you're 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 passionate about it. But so now that you're in law, you 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 zeroed in on human rights in particular. Mm -hmm. Why was that your choice? Yes, um, I think when so when I was doing my undergrads, I think at the bottom at the bottom line of like every career I wanted was to help people. It's always been innate in me to help people. And so when I was doing my undergrad, you know, I did courses like social justice. I also did courses like company law and corporate law and EU law and all those different things. And I enjoyed them. But I think what genuinely gave me fulfillment, what I could talk about all day was human rights. Like it, it was just that simple. When I was doing my thesis, I did it on female um, female imprisonment and the human rights violations that they face. And I could read and read and read and read. Like every time my friends are trying to talk to me, I'm like, oh my gosh, you will not believe what I just read. And they're like, Grace, it's lunchtime, calm down. <laughs> but human rights was the one thing that I didn't get tired of studying. I didn't get tired of reading about, and I genuinely felt like I could make a difference with it. And that's not to say like people are making a difference with company law. I have excellent friends who are in company law, but it was just my thing. Like it was, it it was the thing that I was. It just, it just sat well within me, you know. And I think as well when I was when I was deciding on whether to do a master's or not, I remember having a conversation with a friend and my friend was like, oh, will you do a master's? I was like, if I ever do a master's, it will be in America. And when I got home, I was like, why did I say that? It's like, when have I ever thought about going to America? This, this doesn't add up. And the next day I was in school, it was my final month of final year and I'm walking to get my everyday hot chocolates and I see this sign and it says do a master's in America and I was like okay this is interesting and then I looked into it and there was this international human rights course human rights law course that I saw and I was like this is it for me it, it was basically Notre Dame Notre Dame is a Christian university it's Catholic but it's a Christian university they have you know beautiful values but more than that their motto was create um educating a different kind of lawyer and i knew that was what i wanted to be i, I don't want to be just any type of lawyer and so yeah once i once i went there it was the lid closed case closed i was going to be a human rights lawyer because i loved it there okay so you you from your profile i read that you got a scholarship to do your masters so i i i ask how how the process was because i know that many people um might find it challenging funding and education abroad you mm -hmm. know so how was the application process like you know and what were the things i see from your profile that you did many things many extracurricular things you know yes. was that all leading up to wanting to um eventually apply for a scholarship or those were just things that you were doing naturally because you were interested in them. Because I know that all those extracurricular activities help in the application process. You know, I know I've asked you many things at a go, but I hope, <laughs> <laughs> I hope I'm concise enough for you to be able to answer. No, 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 no. Perfect question. So with my extracurriculars, I did them because I have a lot of energy. I need to expend it. <laughs> So my dad would always say, get it out of your system. It's okay. Um, and so for me, I was really interested in the arts. And I think I get that from my dad. Like he he was, like I said, was an actor, musician, model, teacher. He's done whatever he wanted to do. And I can't... Give us the name of your dad. Oh, no, no. <laughs> he will fight me if I do that. Okay, go ahead. Please, daddy, I love you. <laughs> but, you know... He, he got to do all of those things and he always encouraged me in my arts. Like I used to act, sing, dance. Sometimes I still do. Um, and so my extracurriculars were a way for me to find peace in the midst of university, a way for me to just ex escape from studying and all those things. 
When I was applying for scholarships, though, it came in very handy. Like, I'm, I always tell people I didn't get a first in my undergrad. I didn't. And one thing I realized during my law degree was that because I was so zeroed, zeroed in on studying medicine, the skills I actually needed to excel in a law degree, I struggled to acquire them like research and reading. I generally struggled in first and second year because I was like, these people can't read for Africa and me. Like, I just want to do stuff. I just want to do, you know? And so when I realized that I was struggling academically, I had to, I had like a reality check where I was like, what are my strengths? And my strengths were my extracurriculars. And so in my head, literally, I was like, if I'm not going to get an award for my academics, I will get an award for my extracurriculars. And I got multiple awards for them. And so for people who might feel like they're not great at their academics, what are your strengths? Because you, you have strengths, you have weaknesses, play to your strengths in university. And that really helped me when I was now applying for scholarships, because I could say I had done things that many, many other people had not done. Um, and I will say when I was applying for my scholarship, first time I applied, I did not get it. That's and, good to know, because, because we all see the success story, but nobody sees the pain and the hard work that went into getting there. Yeah, so. Yeah, um, I cried for weeks. <laughs> I cried because I was like, oh my gosh, God, you told me this was the next step. Like, why didn't I get it? I was so upset. And, but I knew that this was something I needed to do. And so I applied again. And this time I applied to two scholarships because I was like, huh? <laughs> I was like, applying to one was not wise. So I applied to two scholarships and I got both of them. Wow. And what, what did you do differently on the, uh, the second time around? Yes. For second time around, I, I got more people to review my application. First time around, I only got asked like two or three people. Second time around, <laughs> everybody read it. Everybody read it. Everybody dissected it they destroyed it they built it up you know i who got as many people who, who, yeah who, who who read it who reviewed it who do you think was good enough to review and give you sound advice for sure one of them was someone who got who did an english major <laughs> she did an english major i said my english needs jesus um i also reached out to people who had gotten the scholarship before Okay. And they read it. I reached out to people who were in the university because they knew what the university would want to hear. They read it. Um, I got my professors to read it. I remember one of my professors, literally, he was like, it's not, it's not notes. I can't remember how I used to say it now. He used to be like, it's not um, note shred dame. It's Notre Dame. I was like, oh, sorry. <laughs> like, <laughs> sorry, sorry. Um, it was. I think he said something like, "If you're going to go to the school, at least know how to say the name." Also, uh, like, sorry, just read it, Cha. Thank you very much. So I got my professors to read it, and um, I I started very early. So it opened in September. I started in September because with scholarship applications, there's so many documents you have to fill in, so many documents you have to submit. You can't afford to leave it last minute. You just can't afford to. Um, and I think the first time around, I definitely left it to the last minute because I was like, ah, sure, be fine. Um, what else did I do differently? I think in my interview, I really tried to show them that they need me. <laughs> I, I literally let them know that if I if I am an alumni of this scholarship program, it will be it will be beneficial to you. I will be an asset to you rather than someone who's just taking. And so um, that was a, that was a few of the things that I did differently. And I think I was more confident. The other thing as well that I probably did differently was I didn't go into the interview thinking this is the be all and end all. Like. If this doesn't happen, it's okay. I'll apply again. I literally told them, I will apply until you give it to me. So. <laughs> wow. Okay. So let's backtrack a bit. So what were some of the extracurricular activities you were in? I, I read from your profile that you started um, a, an enter a social enterprise where you take the remains from bananas and turn them into shoes for I don't know. I can't remember if you said Africa or Nigeria. You know, um, what was the name again? Berry fiber. Fiber berry. Fiber yes, berry. yes. <laughs> I was curious about that. So, so what's that about? Yes. So basically, I did study abroad in England, 
And when I was in England, I joined, I joined this uh, society called Enactus Sheffield. And again, this is me looking for time, to, places to spend my time. And um, within the organization, um, within the society, <clears throat> They basically have different portfolios. I joined the international portfolio. And while I was there, I realized that you can actually, and you know, this is a business idea for anybody who's watching, but you can actually <laughs> convert the byproduct of banana waste into leather. Wow. It's a long process. And um, basically when you plant a banana tree, it can only give you fruit once. And so what happens is the farmers cut it down they burn it, they dump it, like it just becomes useless. But there's so many um, characteristics in that banana fiber, in that banana byproduct that can be turned into something great. And so I started, I first of all found this company that was using pineapples to create leather. And I was like, pineapples, what's going on here? And I just kept looking, I kept looking, I kept looking until I came across like, the characteristics of bananas and how you can literally extract fiber from it to create leather. I was like, surely, surely this is not possible. <laughs> and I kept, you know, I had a year in, in England and that was the, one of the biggest things I did, like literally researching, connecting with farmers in Nigeria, because these farmers could then get paid for what they were doing. We could pay them to give us the the byproduct, then we use the byproduct. We employ people in Nigeria to turn the byproduct into school shoes. These school shoes can then be given to children from disadvantaged communities. And one of the reasons I was actually passionate about this was because the summer before I had come to Nigeria for a friend's wedding and I was in the car with my dad and it was raining, you know, there's no drainage system in some of the places in Ibadan, love Ibadan. Um, and so, a lot of school kids were going to school and they didn't have shoes on and they were walking in the muddy water. And I thought to myself, like all the diseases that they're being exposed to by this water, this isn't, this isn't safe. And so that kind of was my mindset where I was like, I really want to do something to change this. And so that's how fiber berries started. Like literally all of that research, we found an engineering lab in the university. They let us use the engineering lab. And then when we, there was a competition called the Unilever Individual Purpose Competition. And so we entered into this competition and Unilever were able to give us resources that we needed to really push this idea forward. And in order to win the competition, we also had to think of sustainable ways for Unilever to conduct their work. So we were working with one of the ice cream brands, Solero. And what we did was we actually used the banana fibers to create lollipop sticks. Wow. And so instead of using the wooden lollipop sticks that are not biodegradable, that are not sustainable, you could use the banana byproduct to create these lollipop sticks. And so we won the competition, thank God. And, you know, it was it was amazing. I think for me, it was kind of like encouragement and stamp that what I was doing made sense. And, you know, for, for a brand like Unilever to be behind you on a product like that, on a vision like that, it was amazing for us. And... <clears throat> And so that was kind of like what I spent my year in Sheffield doing. And when I left Sheffield, I kind of handed the project over to the society because it was their funding that was going to push the product forward. Yeah. Um, and I was going into final year and I didn't have the capacity to continue to pursue it. Um, but it was it was worthwhile. I mean, even just to connect with farmers in Nigeria and like to identify the people that we wanted to help. It was kind of like a... Cycle. I think I might go back to it eventually, to be honest. But <laughs> okay, that's that's really interesting and and very impactful as well. As in that you you found something that would help um, people mm. in Nigeria in that way. And for someone so young, you know, many of us have lived longer than you and yet haven't ha had as much impact. You know, so mm. um, kudos to you. And and it's mm. it's it also speaks to the fact that um we we are not one thing you know we can do many things and so we shouldn't allow what we do for a living say for instance our jobs to define us or to stop us from exploring yeah. all the yeah. talents that god has given us to explore and to do much more than than um 
we think we are able to, you know, you said you have a lot of energy and, and I feel the same way. I feel that you should die empty as in you should end your life yes. that every single thing i ever dreamed of everything single thing i had a passion for i explored it to its uttermost you know yeah. you know so it's 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 your story is really inspiring so tell me a bit about your podcast i know you you have one as well you know i've listened yes. to a couple of them yeah <laughs> thank you so much so um we're starting off the human rights pod and it's um it was kind of a, a, a project that came out of my master's program where, you know, during my master's, I realized that the people that really talk about human rights are people who are already human rights experts. And so all of these reports that we're creating, you know, they're only for experts who already know everything they need to know about human rights. Or, I mean, obviously the, 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 the discourse is growing, but the actual people whose human rights are being um, affected don't have as much uh, don't have as much education around human rights, and so I wanted to kind of take that and flip it and simplify the language so that it's not just human rights experts that can understand these twenty page reports. I want everyday people to be able to understand I have a right to food, I have a right to water, I have a right to um, an adequate standard of living, I have a right to vote. One of the things that, mm, I don't know if I should say it here, <laughs> I'm just going to say that people in diaspora, in countries that have signed up to the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights have a right to vote in elections that are happening in their countries. I will say that and leave it there. Um, so... <laughs> no, but but so, I'll, I'll, I'll interject uh, because I don't want to forget. You, you know, all these things that you're saying about everybody's funda hum fundamental human right. Mm -hmm. You know, the thing is that it... it I wonder both for developed and developing countries how how an individual can translate that human right to reality as in say I know that I have a right to to water to feed in the fact mm -hmm. that I, I know that I have that right does not translate into me actually having water and food you know I can go and protest on the street that it's my right to eat you know but it doesn't mean that I'm going to actually going to get food you know mm -hmm. It, it might be a little bit different in, in developed countries, you know, but mm -hmm. in developing countries, I mean, the world is like, who cares? You know, so how do how does that help? Exactly. I love that. How does that help? I think, first of all, education is the key to many, many things, because if people are educated on what their human rights are, the more empowered to fight for them. Now, the system is very different between developed countries and developing countries. In developed countries, you kind of know, I can, you know, protest or I can go to court and somebody will listen to me. In developing countries, not so much. I think that's where the issue is in terms of, for me, I am a huge advocate for human rights policy. And so designing policies that are human rights based. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I realized that I wanted to be the kind of lawyer that was in parliament making the decisions rather than going to litigation when the damage is already done. And so for people in developing countries, one of the biggest ways is to try to elect people who will fight for their human rights or to be the person who is in parliament fighting for the human rights, because it's, it is within these policies that change really happens when a com when a government assigns money to look after, you know, for example, clean water in an environment, then people can get have access to clean water. But I would also like to say, and I love what you said earlier about um, your job doesn't confine you, right? I've realized that I'm very entrepreneur, I'm very creative, I'm very innovative. And so where policy ends, innovation will begin. And so for some people who literally I've noticed, like, for example, there's no clean water in my in my in my community, but we have a right to clean water. What is in your hands that you can do? Can you fundraise? Can you create a campaign that actually gets people to donate money to build a clean water pipe in your community? Because sometimes politicians might not help us. Sometimes government might not help us. And we have to kind of take our human rights into our own hands and see how we can realize them for ourselves. Right. And so. I think 
that's kind of what I would say, like policy helps, but where, you know, you have elected people that don't seem to care about human rights, then it's down to the NGOs, the, the, the young people, the older people, the communities to come together and really say, how can we realize these rights? And how can we partner with, you know, people abroad to make sure that they can invest in these rights as well. I'm always happy to speak to NGOs or like young people in developing countries who don't know, who are trying to bridge a gap and they don't really know how to bridge that gap. Um, because yeah, sometimes policy fails. That's the truth. Yeah, interesting. That That's a great answer. I, I was wondering how you were going to navigate that question. <laughs> you, you did I was wondering it. too. <laughs> Okay, so I, I'm curious, how did you um, get to start your internship in the UN? I know it, it's not very easy to, to get a place there, so how did it work out for you? Honestly, God's divine favor. I cannot even lie. Um, I had applied for the internship when I was um when I was doing the International Academy of International Law, and it was when I finished my master's, and this is probably something that a lot of people don't know, but when I finished my master's, I really struggled to find a job. And it was strange to me because I have all of this experience, like you said, you know, I graduated really well during my master's. I was quite surprised. I was, like I said, the academics is not really my, <laughs> my, my thing, but over there, I really did well. Like, and God, God was faithful. And so when I finished my master's, I really struggled to find a job. I applied to everything. You know, I would always be on the phone to my best friend. Like, I just got another rejection letter. This is so sad. And, but I did know God was setting me up. And so I applied in July for this UN internship. And I didn't get a response back till October. To be honest, I forgot about it. Like, I didn't even, I just kept applying for stuff and hoping that something would come out. And, you know, the UN internships are unpaid. And so it can be a bit hard for people. It can be a bit hard for people to, you know, commit to them because they're unpaid as well. Well, the ones within the UN sectariat. And so, um, yeah, I applied in July. I think I'll, I'll probably maybe speak about tips or speak about things that maybe made my application stand out. Mm -hmm. And we've spoken a lot about extracurriculars. But generally speaking, I have so much experience with extracurriculars and that it made me stand out in terms of like having transferable skills. So I remember speaking to people about my application later on and realizing that the amount of experience that I have was one of the things that made me stand out, especially within my within the specific internship that I'm doing. You know, I do a lot of like I create a lot of content. I create a lot of videos. I do research work. I create content. I do research work. I create content. And so the fact that I had those transferable skills of like content creating, marketing, communications, negotiation, all of that stuff made me stand out. I think for people when, when they are applying to the UN, for people when they are applying to the UN internships, sometimes they think that they have to only put like professional experience down but it's not like put everything down. I put gospel choir down. I put everything down because the first thing I've noticed that a lot of recruiters might look at is your work experience. And so if you put like two months down, automatically they're thinking she doesn't have enough experience to do an internship. So I would put as many, as much work experience down as possible. And I guess in your motivation statement, like talking about what makes you stand out, is is key because a lot of people have the same stuff i'm passionate about human rights i'm passionate about working at the un mm. so what makes you different <laughs> yeah yeah and, and are there prospects to be able to transition into something per permanent yeah so within the un secretary the way it works is if you do an internship then you have to wait six months before you apply for a permanent role um i'm not sure why that is the case <laughs> I think it might be because um, I guess people need to rest before they jump into like a more permanent role. I'm not too sure why that is the case, but um, yeah, so it's it's not like you just kind of slide into your permanent role. And I think, you know, to be honest, I think it's a good system in terms of 
it allows them to have more interns. Cause I think if, if an intern just like slides into a permanent role, then they might not need an intern again and all that stuff. So they're going through a lot of interns and I, I think it's, it's a great system to just get a lot of experience. Okay. Okay. Fantastic. Okay. I'm going to div- divert a bit. You, you organized um, a training recently for, for women and young 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 ladies and uh, young girls you know and um, I remember your quote you said you did it afraid you know so um, could you explain your motivation for wanting to share um, your experience why you organized it who were the people in particular that you were focused on was it people from Nigeria or people from where you are now you know and just just give us an idea of what it was about Yes. So it was a very random thing. <laughs> I, I know for over the past few years, you know, I've helped friends um, apply for things. I have helped strangers on LinkedIn apply for things. And I knew that for me, I think I've gotten to the point where I don't know everything, but I've done so many applications and helped so many people applications that I kind of have an idea of what you should be putting down on your applications. But I find that a lot of people struggle with their applications. They don't know what to put down. Or some people will say to me, well, Grace, I don't have work experience. I've just I've just served in Sunday school for five years. That's work experience. Yeah. <laughs> it is about how you communicate on your, on your CV. It's about how you communicate on your um, applications. And so I really wanted, I was thinking, you know, I was thinking International Women's Day. And I really think the Holy Spirit dropped the idea in my mind because I'd forgotten about it. So I was speaking to my partner about it and I was like, you know, it would be great to have a session where, you know, young people, young women just feel more equipped. Because the other thing as well is a lot of, we find that the reason a lot of men are in higher positions of authority is because women usually don't apply or women don't think they're good enough. Whereas men tend to just be like, I'm not qualified, I'm gonna apply anyway. And that comes from a place of confidence. And so I really wanted a, like the women that would attend the, the workshop to not only dream, but feel equipped to pursue those dreams, you know? Not to just be like, oh, I don't have this, I don't have that. How can I leverage what I have? Because that's what I have done. You know, getting full rides was a huge, huge thing to do. And I was the youngest in my class in, in my master's program, like youngest. And so I have, I've, I think my mindset has always been, okay, fine. I don't have this. I don't have that. But what do I have and how can I leverage it? And I wanted to teach people how to leverage what they already had. Um, and so it was key for me to be able to empower them that way. Like, this is what you write on your CV. This is how you communicate it. If you if you haven't done this, have you done this? Um, if you're answering a question, this is how you this is how you answer those questions. If you're an interview, this is how you say what you need to say. Um, don't just speak about having big dreams. Create a vision board. Like these are the things that have really helped me along the way. And I'm not the type of person to hoard help mm-hmm. I'm, i don't help hoard information there's no point whatsoever if we're all going to excel we're all going to excel together and so i really wanted to share and it was free i wanted to share as much as possible people can get the replay um but i really wanted to share with as many people as possible these tips that have literally helped me in my career over the past few years like education is key <laughs> I keep saying that. <laughs> yeah, you're right. I'm I'm curious about how your vision board looks like. I'm so curious. And do you do you do you do a new one every year, or you or you keep the same one until you tick off all the boxes? No, so definitely a new one every year. And how we started off was I remember I think during maybe during the pandemic I had this I had this few months where I just felt like really dejected. I just felt like nothing was really happening in my life. You know, I, I think at that point, at that point I was waiting for my scholarships to get back to me. I was working in a job that I liked, but wasn't fulfilling me. Um, and I just didn't, I was like, I didn't feel like dreaming. So I remember one day I was just sitting at home and I think, I can't remember if I was having a conversation with the Holy Spirit, but I remember I brought out my notebook Um, my online notebook and I started saying what do I want my life to look like 10 years from now 
and I wrote a list of like 50 things, how much I want to be earning, the type of family I want to have, where I want to be living, what I want my parents to be doing, you know, like everything about everybody in my life. Like I had a picture. And then I said, what can I do this year to get me closer to that? And that's what my vision board is. Every year I'm saying five things that I'm going to commit to accomplishing this year to get me closer to that 10 year goal. And I do change it every year. And if I don't, if I don't get something the year before I move it to the next year, if it's necessary. So for example, I've been trying to get my driving done for the past two, three years, pray for me. And do you know what? Every year I have gotten closer to it. So last year, um, because I was in America doing my master's and then I moved here, I couldn't really work on it. But the year before I did all my 12 lessons so I can drive. I just don't have my license. So this year I'm committed to getting my license so I can be on the road and be chilling with everybody. And so, <laughs> but you know, that's, that's probably been the, um, one thing that I've had to move over the past couple of years, but everything else, um, by the grace of God, I've been able to just zero in on and and accomplish and i remember you know last year i put the un on my vision board but i i just put it on you know like i was like i'd love to after i finish my masters work at the un and i'm here now and i'm so thankful to god for this incredible opportunity but i think when the bible says like make the vision plain it is it 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 is Bible. <laughs> it is like, this is it. This is what we do here. And using a vision board allows me to make that vision plain that like, if anybody asks me to do anything that's outside of these five goals, I know how to say no. I know what my focus is. I know what my direction is. Um, and it's really, really helped me. That's fantastic. Do, do you have speaking another language as part of your goals i'm just wondering if you are required to be bilingual for your role in uh, yes yes one of the things that definitely makes people stand out is speaking multiple languages Mm -hmm. and so again (laughs) in school um i i did i took french classes i took chinese classes um i studied irish in secondary school um, I speak Yoruba, I speak english because we're speaking english here um and so i've over time learned a lot of languages because I love learning languages. But if you are going to have an international career, it will stand to you if you know more than one language, like for sure, like straight away in your your application, it's like, oh, she can speak two, three languages. Wow. Amazing. All right. Great. So um, this is my second to the last question. (laughs) It's been great speaking to you. So what, what, um, what, what do you want us to remember about our conversation? What, what, do you want to tell people that you think it will be most impactful for them to hear? Oh, hard question. Do you know what? I would say there was something you said earlier about dying empty. And one of my favorite quotes is by Miles Monroe. And he says, but I think people argue that it's by Les Brown. Doesn't really matter. But <laughs> the, he says the grave is the richest place in the world because that's where you will find the books that were not written, the songs that were not sung, you know, the the, the products that were never never designed. And I think for me, that's been one of my biggest kind of like mottos in life that every desire, that every idea that enters me, every God given idea, I will pursue it. And it's okay. I, like I'm not afraid of failure. I think I think I my my twenties, my thirties. Like I'm, I'm so committed to exploring everything that's on the inside of me to the fullest to make sure that I die empty. I don't want to be one of the people that's contributing to the grave. I I'm not interested in that. And so for everybody that's listening, I would strongly recommend, you know, that you take some time to really explore. <laughs> what it is God has put on the inside of you for this earth, because there's so much like God isn't a God who's just like, Oh, let me just put her on this earth. Plop. That's that. There's a, like literally there's an expression of God that's on the inside of you for this earth. And so explore that so that you're not contributing to the grave as well. Do things absolutely afraid. When I put out that workshop, honestly, I expected like 15 people to sign up. 
I'm, I can't lie. I started 15, I was like, if 15 people show up, I'm gonna be proud. <laughs> and 200 people, 200 people signed up. And so there was a need that I didn't even realize was there. And then t someone literally texted me two days ago to say that they got into their dream master's program based off of that workshop. Imagine I just hoarded all of that information and didn't express it. What I'm trying to say is there's something so beautiful on the inside of each and every one of us that the world needs to um, encounter. And so please, please do it afraid. Please don't be afraid of failure. Please just ex ex express that because the world needs it. There are people around you that need you to manifest. <laughs> And I just want to say, I just want to say, I love, I love what this podcast is about, because I think there are many people who are in careers that feel maybe trapped or feel like they can't explore the other side of them. And there was something you said, even in the conversation earlier about being multifaceted, we're all created to be multifaceted. And I love what this podcast is about, because it's, it no, for real, because you can, I can be a lawyer and I can still be an entrepreneur. I can still be a speaker. I can still be someone who loves coloring books. If you ever want to buy me something, coloring books, but <laughs> I can be all those things and it's okay. And it's okay to try things and fail and try and fail and try and succeed. So, um, yes, thank you so much for this platform because it's, it's such a blessing. Ah, uh, thank you. Thank you so much. So my last question is not really a question to you, but it's, it's what I always ask um each each guest that i interview to keep the ball rolling i i usually ask if my guests can refer someone else so that the the conversation can keep going and mm -hmm. the content is rich enough to cater for every single possible passion that anybody trying to pursue can look at and see an example somewhere so mm -hmm. i'll be reaching out to you after the podcast for a referral i hope you won't mind Oh, please do. I already have someone in my mind straight off the bat that you would love to interview. Fantastic. <laughs> it's been a pleasure. Thank you for taking our time. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Okay.